Welcome back. Media organizations are coming out in support of journalist Karen Morn. This week, former President Jacob Zuma filed a private prosecution against her. The campaign for free expression says this is an attack on media freedom. It is alleged Morn exposed Zuma's confidential medical information with the help of advocate Billy Downer. Meanwhile, two city press journalists have been suspended following allegations of extortion. Is the industry under threat? That is the question. And what is the psychological impact of being a journalist? To unpack this, I'm joined by Anton Haber, who is executive director of the Campaign for Free Expression. And psychologist Sats Cooper joins us as well for this conversation. Good evening and uh, welcome to both of you. Um, let me start with you, Anton. Um, just on the, your, your take uh, on this private prosecution of Karen Morn. The allegation, of course, from Zuma's side, uh, former President Zuma's uh, side, is that she facilitated, facilitated and was uh, instrumental in the unlawful publishing of what was marked confidential. Her side is that actually this was contained in court documents by the time that she published, uh, regardless of the fact that she may have received the document prior, but she observed uh, that embargo and only published once this became a public document. So what have you made of all of this? So first, let's just make sure we've got the facts straight. Um, the law says distribution of material that's part of the investigative docket is not allowed um, before and until it's um, in the court record until it's tabled in court. Um, what is alleged, so, so in fact, what, what, what she did here was she received the documents, she did not distribute or publish them until they'd been tabled in court. So it really is um, a weak case and I think that implies it's a malicious case which has ulterior motives. Um, because I, I see I see no evidence that she distributed the material. It was not confidential. It was tabled in court. Neither party asked for it to be sealed. It was not medical records. It was simply a, included a medical certificate. There was nothing private or confidential about it. Yeah. In fact, the version uh, that the uh, News 24 has, has put out, is, it, it says, uh, and I hear you saying it's a, it's a medical certificate, they say it is a letter. Uh, from a, um, you know, a military doctor uh, that was included even in the papers that were filed by Mr. Zuma's own team uh, in support of, of, of their case. At that point, it was about the postponement uh, of the proceedings in his corruption uh, trial. So just for someone who perhaps doesn't get why this incident would constitute a threat to media freedom, first of all, does it? And, and why? It does, for two reasons. And one must see how extraordinary and unusual it is for somebody who's being prosecuted to undertake a private prosecution against media covering their case, never mind against the prosecutor um, as well. I think it's unprecedented. I think there's two reasons that it's a threat. The first is that it's an attack on a journalist, on Karen Morn, um, and I think an attempt to harass and intimidate her um, but second, you know, having open courts in which journalists do what we're, what we're taught to do, which is gather the information, talk to both parties, and report um, on the documentation and the evidence uh, before the court. Um, uh, that's, all Karen, that's all Karen did. And so an attack on that is an attack on the open court system, which is so fundamental to our justice system and our democracy, uh, and that's why I think it's particularly worrying and serious. Yeah. Anton, I was saying, um, and, and, and I'm playing devil's advocate here, I was saying that journalists should be beyond the reach of the law, uh, you know, arguments being put forward by Mr. Zuma's side include allegations that the publication of that information violates his rights to dignity and privacy, and, and, etc. What, what, what are we saying about journalists being held to similar standards to everyone else um, around those issues, issues such as those? 
I, I'm certainly not arguing for a special case for journalists. Um, I do think sometimes one can argue that any citizen who exposes and distributes material in the public interest should be protected from doing so, like whistleblowers and journalists, ordinary citizens who, who publish material of public interest. But I think the critical thing here is that is that these there was nothing in these documents that infringed his dignity or his privacy the documents came from his side they did not ask for them to be sealed she waited for them to be tabled in court so that it was legal for her to publish it um so that's why i think it's an it's 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 an attack on her and it's an attack on the work journalists do in ensuring our courts are open and, yeah. and subject to scrutiny all right, let me bring in Sats Cooper into this conversation. We'll explore other elements as well in a moment, Anton. Uh, Prof Co Professor Cooper, <laughs> I can tell you now, I mean, uh, in being in this line of work, if I was to be sued in a personal capacity and an amount of money is needed, that would stress me out. But I can only imagine facing criminal charges, um, you know, a private prosecution in this particular instance. What is the psychology of being exposed um, to such a threat um, that, that even your, you know, if, if uh, the worst case scenario plays out, you could end up with a conviction? I think it must be terrifying for this journalist. I think that under the circumstances that we have, and have had actually in this country for a long time, pre the democratic era, uh, frontline persons, first-line responders, and often it's, uh, you know, let's, let's be realistic about other people uh, who are, uh, who put themselves out, can get into the turmoil of what happens. Journalists are particularly exposed to that, and therefore there needs to be uh, a different way to deal with this. Uh, I'm glad uh, Anton has said that journalists are not sacrosanct because uh, nobody ought to be sacrosanct. Uh, the prevailing uh, climate is one, and we've seen this with uh, especially electronic media journalists being threatened, uh, being physically jostled, and so on. Uh, this will take an emo enormous uh, strain on their mental well-being, their ability to look and prepare themselves well for the charges against them, uh, what they confronted. And uh, fortunately, we're in a different era now, and there are organizations like those Anton and others represent who uh, are uh, coming out publicly in support of Karen Moore. Uh, previously, in the apartheid era, people were left on their own resources. Indeed, journalists are very vulnerable. They left totally to their own resources. They're not taught how to deal with some of the issues we confront on the front line. And, uh, I, you know, it's ironic. I mean, I, Anton and I are here because there was a story in the Rand Daily Mail uh, in, I think, 84, where he put me in... Tembisa wielding a machete, and it, it wasn't true. Um, the deputy editor went to him. I was there the first time I set eyes on Anton, and he acknowledged that he wasn't there physically. At that time, your life was in serious danger because you could have been killed because there was uh, all this internecine stuff going on. Unfortunately, it prevails now as mm. well that you can get put into situations like Karen, like many of the ENC, ENCA and other electronic journalists have been, where they get threats from political, from criminal people, from business, uh, because all of them conjoin in some way, uh, bringing us to the terrible state of affairs yeah. we're in right now. So it's a very frightening, tenuous uh, situation, and it needs to stop we need to stop the bullying yeah. we need to stop the threats and we need to stop the kinds of outing that happens on social media for instance yeah. but it's free access prof cooper while you mention uh, the issue of social media 
has social media and other you know modern ways of interacting um, sort of encroached in the personal space in that the threats perhaps in the past you know you could make a threat against a journalist but you know right now you are in their space instantly communicating those threats directly with them and in recent times i mean we saw the late karima brown for example being exposed uh, to dangers actual dangers uh, quite a number of times including incidents that took place at her home uh, with an element that suggests that the ease of sharing personal private information such as residential addresses of journalists has become all the all the more greater uh, in the age of social media yes it's all these are easily discoverable even though you may have a certain sense of privacy and anonymity in terms of uh, living in a block that uh, is protected uh, people can get to you and they can find out where you are so if you in the journalism space if you're in the commentator space if you in a few other spaces like that or in uh, as we've seen now whistleblowers then you at great risk we do not have the kind of law and order protections for citizens let alone this group of people who actually do us proud by unearthing things which are otherwise would be uh, completely behind uh, thick walls. They are brave. They actually are brave sometimes. Uh, when you look back and think about the, the people who do those things, you yourself, to uh, uh, to were going into certain situations when you were a few years younger than, are you still young, but a few years younger. <laughs> uh, ago, you'd be thinking, how did I manage to do that? I had to have some chutzpah to unearth the truth to be there. And unfortunately, these are not taught in journalism school. They're not taught in terms of how you should deal with them, how you should interview people in particular situations, how you can debrief, how you can de-stress. All those things are part of that space. And I think all of us need to take note of it. Uh, you know, from the mental health sphere, psychologists. I know I speak for the Psychological Society of South Africa uh, right now, where we've been concerned in the uh, era of the South African Union of Journalists, in the Mwasa period. We used to do workshops. Uh, now nobody does anything. Nobody in the newsroom prepares you to go out and what you're going to expect. Yeah. Nobody debriefs you really. So all these combined to create a sense of isolation and adds to anxiety and inability to focus on what you should be focusing on, your work, uh, your work exposing the truth. Yeah. Anton, the media economy has come in for a major shakeup uh, in the wake of COVID-19 and its impact on resources, the financial resources uh, of the various institutions. It's good to see that News24 is standing by Karen Mon uh, and basically supporting her. But I'm just wondering um, if, if we think about this chilling effect uh, argument that another journalist in another institution or perhaps even a freelance journalist would perhaps be faced with a different set of circumstances. What, what's your assessment of the institutional support uh, for journalists who do this work in the name of institutions, but also sometimes, you know, as freelancers who actually feed into, um, you know, the activities of media organizations in South Africa? Where do we stand currently? Um, well, let me say, um, uh, in response to um, uh, Dr. Cooper as well, that um, it's true that there has, um, for long periods, not been sufficient attention paid to the protection, particularly the psychological protection um, of journalists and the possibilities of journalists, particularly in violent situations, suffering from post-traumatic stress. But um, in, in, in more recent years, um, the National Editors Forum has tied up with uh, SADAC, the Depression and Anxiety Group, to provide services to journalists. Uh, there's a big push in SANEF to get newsrooms to train, um, make debriefings available, um, and to spot journalists um, who, who, who may be uh, showing symptoms 
um, of such stress. So there is a move. I know we have a big conference later in the year and we're bringing out international experts to talk about a journalist safety and to advise and to direct and to train. So there is movement on that front, I'm pleased to say. But um, the, the vulnerability of journalists has grown considerably um, as a result partly of social media um, because some of the vitriol that um, journalists, particularly women journalists, face um, in these situations, um, a, a dog whistle like, like is sometimes blown in relation to Karen Morn leads to an onslaught from that person's followers online that is misogynist, sometimes racist, that is, um, threatens violence and is extremely unpleasant. So we need to recognize this as a, as a social problem that we need to address, to recognize the importance, the position, the value of journalists and the need to allow them to operate without these kinds of things, which, which must chill all journalists, particularly young journalists, who face them when they're doing their uh, ordinary everyday work. Yeah. Lastly, Anton, um, you, you get the final word. Um, if this, you know, if we put this um, within the context that says journalists themselves have not covered themselves in glory in some instances, as you and I talk right now, News 24 confirming that they have suspended two of their journalists for allegations of extortion. Now, you and I saying that we should be held to account as organizations and institutions that wield power um, in, in a democratic South Africa is one thing, but actually putting in place those mechanisms that ensure that we can be held to account without you know, exposing us to threats against media freedom as the ones we've been criticizing now, um, that there's a bit of a gap, people say, uh, that there's a bit of a disconnect. We are quick with platitudes that say uh, we should be held to account, journalists should uphold the standards, should, 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 but never actually uh, get to where we see consequence management and, and real accountability. Um, I think you make a very good point. Um, I think we have to hold each other to account. Um, journalists have to scrutinize each other and point out where we get it wrong and where we make mistakes and do things we shouldn't do. I think our press council and broadcast complaints commission should be absolutely firm and rigid um, on journalists to break the ethical code. And I think employers um, are critical in this, in taking action against journalists um, who break um, uh, the code of conduct. So to hear that, um, I think you said it was City Press has suspended two journalists. It's very sad to hear that, but pleasing that the newspaper has taken uh, what sounds like quick and firm action um, to discipline those, those journalists. And if it turns out to be true, I, should, I can only hope that they are isolated by the journalistic community and unless they um, uh, redeem themselves, they're chased out of that community. I absolutely agree. We've got to be very firm and strict uh, and hold ourselves even more accountable than we hold um, um, others who wield power in our society. It's ter terribly important in order to rebuild the trust um, that, that journalism relies on. All right, I've got to leave it there. Thank you for your time and your inputs, Anton Haber and uh, Professor Sats Cooper. They're weighing in uh, on that conversation around uh, the summonses, uh, criminal summonses that have been served on Karen Morn uh, and Billy Downer uh, for a private prosecution by former President Jacob Zuma.